finally to the university. But from the age of 12, I never trusted or believed in God at all anymore. As far as I was concerned, if he did exist, he was a dragon, and I wanted nothing to do with him. And when I came to university, there I studied science, and I studied zoology, and I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And there I found out about the whole evolution theory, and I was at a university that was the bastion of evolution. Evolution was dished up for all meals. Every class had an evolutionary basis. And it's amazing because it was really, it started off as a religious university, and it has a big theology school, and yet the science faculty was incredibly secular, and in terms of its teachings, very, very evolutionary. They had some very important names in the listings of their professors, Robert Broom and people like that who had worked with the Taung Skull, the human so-called ancestor, and our museums were full of these people, and I really got into the evolution theory, and I thought this was the answer to all the problems. While at the university, I had a roommate. I was in the hostel there, and uh, my roommate was a very nice guy, but he was very new age, even for that time. That's a long time ago. So to, the, the word new age wasn't even known at that time. And uh, he was into Scientology. You know the science of Scientology, where they put you on the e-meter and you, you go through your past lives and through all the problems that you had, and you clear your karma by talking it through and talking it out, and then eventually, well, then you become God and you've got it made. In any case, he became my best friend. And I had nowhere to go on weekends. I had nowhere to go during the holidays. I always had to work, to put myself through university because my stepmother had convinced my father that he mustn't pay anything, so I put myself through. I had a great relationship with my father years later, so that'll come right, as you can see. Even the worst situations can come right. And on holidays, I didn't know what to do, so I used to go home with this chap to where he lived, 2,000 kilometers away, in another city called Durban. And every holiday I used to go home with him because I had no home to go to. And there I met my current roommate, my wife, who happened to be his sister. Far better roommate than he ever was, I'll tell you. <laughs> and I have to tell you a little bit about her background. Now you know why I was an atheist. I didn't believe anything. I accepted the evolution theory. It was the answer to all my problems. Now her background was entirely different. Her father worked in his younger days for a newspaper and he was sent to investigate all the strange occult occurrences in the country. So he worked for this newspaper and he had his team and his infrared cameras and all the stuff that you need and he toured the country from one strange occurrence to the other. He was very skeptical. He believed nothing. He thought it was a big joke, and seances were a big joke and a big fake. And as he attended one meeting after the other, he realized that this was no joke. When he started investigating some of the strange events, and he put up a camera, at one, and one seance he was putting up cameras and he was always looking underneath for hidden mics and what have you, and something grabbed him, there was nobody that grabbed him, but something grabbed him and beat him up to such an extent that he had an egg-sized boil on the top of his head and was lucky to get away with it with his life. Now when that happens to you, you start thinking, well, <laughs> there was some hidden microphone that did that. <laughs> and he came into situations which were so strange that he became involved in them later. Situations like uh, a house where when the little child had been sent to bed, the shoes would come walking through the room. 
And another situation where a newborn baby used to scream hysterically, and when the parents came in, they'd always used to find the baby on top of the cupboard, newborn baby, out of the cot, on top of a cupboard, and they'd walk up and just manage to save the child as it fell down. Now he went to that house and he sealed every single window and he had his guards outside because he thought, you know, somebody was playing the fool. And he kept the lock and he waited there and sure enough the child screamed and he went in and there the child was on top of the cupboard and he just caught it as it fell down. There was other occasions when in a certain house human excrement was flying around. And he sat in this house and it started howling and the human excrement started flying against all the walls. Strange, strange occurrences. Witchcraft of the worst kind. There was one house that was plagued by a baboon that used to come in and tear everything apart. That's a big ape. And it tore everything apart and it terrorized this family and they could never catch it. And then one day they shot this baboon as it came in and it ran out and the blood trail ended up on the, on the veranda outside. And as they came out, the blood trail ended and there lay one of the workers dead. So this was typical African witchcraft as you find it uh, in Africa, in some places even today still. And this convinced him that there definitely was something going on and he got into... Uh, seances more deeply and then he started learning that you know there were higher uh, mediums and lower mediums the riffraff mediums for the for the lower people the higher mediums who communicated with the better spirits and this is how he became involved in this type of thing and then eventually he moved into the new age sort of movement and became very high up in this sort of agenda. He wrote books on it and uh, he was very well received in those circles. Later on, later in life, my wife's parents got divorced and he married a person, a, a lady, who was also very, very high up in the New Age movement. In fact, she is one of the instructors in the Course of Miracles. She teaches people how to become Christ's and to perform miracles. Incredibly evil situations sometimes in that house and uh, the, the occurrences that happened in my, my wife's house as a, as a child were very strange indeed. They would have one chair where there was always someone sitting breathing heavily and they had a cane that used to go a walking and a rattling and sort of things like that. She grew up with this situation. To her it was nothing. She was used to it. Now to me it was very strange and I was an atheist. I didn't believe anything. I, you know, I tried to rationalize it in a scientific sense. And then when my wife and I got married, we moved to the city where I was in the university. And for years there was no real problem. And then my wife, uh, we had first the first child, the second child, and then the youngest child my wife was expecting when my father-in-law came to visit. And uh, he moved in into an outside flat that we had, an apartment, and there he stayed with us. Now thinking back, I know that this is where it all started. Because if you have an occult presence, then you will have this influence on your home for a long time. I can perhaps tell you that when we were just married, we moved to very close to them, and there were very, very strange occurrences in our house. Absolutely horrendous occurrences on some occasions. Our dishes would fly through the rooms and smash against the walls, and things like that. Or you'd park the car and the car would rock and f fall over against the side of the garage. We had very strange happenings in, on a previous occasion. But you forget about those things and, you, and later on you rationalize them as well and you say they didn't exist or they were strange. When my wife was expecting this last child, when my father-in-law moved in, she became very ill indeed. 
so ill that we didn't think that she would survive. And she was in hospital, in and out of hospital, and on a respirator, 